having figured out what marginal and average means and how to calculate them, we're now going to apply that to profit. Our theory, as I mentioned before, is that profit is what the firm cares about. We're not going to distinguish between short run and long run profit until much later in the semester when we get to exhaustible resource economics um, and, and perhaps the renewable resource economics part. So let's start with um, the definition of profit and the components. Profit is total revenue minus total cost. And so let me define the components of that. Total revenue is price times quantity. So if a firm sells a certain quantity, like the firm sells 10 units of a product, and the price is $5 a unit, then the total revenue is $50. We'll abbreviate price with P and quantity with Q. And so total revenue price times quantity is P times Q. Now, I've written it here, P of Q times Q. What this means is that price might be a a function of quantity. In other words, as quantity changes, price might change. This is something that even consumers are familiar with. You might face a different price if you only buy one unit of a good than if you buy five units of the good. You might get a volume discount if you buy five units. So that would be an example of a situation where when quantity went up, the price, which means the price per unit, the per unit price goes down. The firm also, so this is thinking about things from the firm's point of view, from the seller's point of view, not the buyer's point of view. But if the firm has instituted a program like that, then it realizes that if it's, it's going to give quantity discounts to consumers who, who buy more. So that's just one example, perhaps not one of the more important examples, of how the price that a firm receives for its quantity can depend on how much quantity is sold. The next thing here is this sentence, which is going to be pretty important. Economists like to talk about competitive firms, but the term is actually extremely deceptive. Indeed, once I tell you what the definition of a competitive is, which I will in about 30 seconds, then you'll see that in some sense, what economists call competitive firms are what a normal people would call non-competitive firms. So let me explain. The initial definition I want to give is just mathematical. In general, total revenue is P of Q times Q, but if price actually doesn't depend on quantity, if price is a mathematical constant, so like price is $5 a unit, it doesn't matter how many units the firm sells. Then we can simplify P of Q times Q to just writing P times Q. In this equation, Q is the variable. We're wondering what Q is, what Q is the firm going to choose? That's the firm's ultimate question in this kind of framework. How much should it produce? And the firm is trying to figure out how to pick Q in order to maximize profit. So if the firm is competitive, then P is simply a number. It do, it's not a function of Q, or it's a constant function of Q. It's just some number. So we can just write total revenue here as P times Q, where P is just a simple number. Now let's pause for a minute to think about what it really means to say that a firm is competitive in economics. So I defined it as a constant P. Another way that economists sometimes describe uh, constant P is that the firm takes price as given. The tool that the firm has to affect things is its choice of Q. But if P doesn't depend upon Q, 
and in a competitive situation, P doesn't depend on Q, then the firm can't affect P. So that's the sense in which we say that the firm takes price as given. It means the firm can't affect it. Now, it might be hard for you to imagine a situation where a firm takes the price as given, where the firm can't affect quantity. And the reason is because almost all the firms that you and I interact with as consumers a, a, a do set prices. They don't take prices given. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, the grocery store manager has decided, or some executive in the grocery store chain has decided what price to charge. And if they decide to change their mind, then the price changes. Um, if you go for to buy a car, the car dealer um, certainly decides what price they're going to sell the car for. And there might be some bargaining involved where it's even more obvious that the seller decides what the price is going to be. So it's extremely hard to relate to this kind of so-called competitive situation where the firm takes prices as given. The best example I can think of is suppose you're a corn farmer in, let's say, Iowa. Now, corn farmers in Iowa don't affect the price of corn. Even if you're a fairly large corn farmer in Iowa, you're not large compared to the whole United States output of corn. Plus, corn is actually a commodity that's traded internationally, even across oceans. So there's a worldwide price of corn, and no one farmer in Iowa is going to be doing anything that's going to change the worldwide price of corn. So a corn farmer in Iowa is an example of a quote-unquote competitive firm, of a firm that takes the prices given. Another example would be, let's say your, uh, some oil, some petroleum gets produced by small producers that only have maybe you know, three or four, maybe 10 wells. They're not this big giant company like ExxonMobil or Shell. If you're a small oil producer and you're only running 10 or 20 oil wells, uh, you're not going to affect the price of oil. You're going to take the price of oil as given. So there are examples like that in the economy of the firms that economists call competitive because they take the price as given. But to be perfectly frank, in the modern world, there are not many firms like that. This is a very unusual situation. Which then raises the question, if if being competitive is such an unusual situation, why do economists like to always be talking about competitive firms? And in fact, why will we in the semester almost exclusively be talking about competitive firms instead of talking about more of the firms that we really interact with in the real world that don't take prices given, that, that set their own prices. Okay, so the reason is actually right here. Mathematically, it's a whole lot easier to assume that price is a constant and work with this equation than it is to assume that price is a variable and work with this equation. If you assume that the price is a variable, then you have this function p of q, and then the next question is, well, what does p of q look like? Is it rising? Is it falling? Is it U-shaped? What, what is the relationship between price and quantity? And I mean, it could be rising, it could be falling, it sort of depends, depends on what kind of industry it is, how, how competition is structured, and so forth and so on. So you start getting into this uh, potentially long investigation as to what exactly P of Q looks like when you're not getting any closer to what we in this class are trying to get closer to, which is studying the environment and how the economy interacts with the environment. Whereas, if you just go with the, the competitive assumption and you do the PQ thing, well, everything's simple there. P is just a number. So, to be perfectly frank, the main reason why economists assume 
that firms are competitive. And I don't want to say that all economists assume that firms are competitive. In fact, there's an entire subdiscipline of economics called industrial organization where the economists assume that no firms are competitive. But why in a class like this one we're going to assume that firms are competitive when clearly they usually aren't is because it makes the math a whole lot easier. And because in our class, our focus is going to be on the environment, it's going to be on pollution, it's going to be on natural resource depletion. It's not going to be on, are you a price-taking firm or not? It just makes everything a lot simpler mathematically for us to make the assumption that firms are competitive. And so, for better or for worse, that's the excuse we're, 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 going, to, uh, we're going to make. Okay, so that um, that explains that. Let me just do some erasing here. So from now on, unless I say something otherwise, we're going to assume competitive firms. And that means the total revenue is some number P times Q. Now how about profit? So profit is total revenue minus total cost. As you'll see in the next video, we're going to make some pretty simple assumptions about total cost. Um, actually, I think I should talk a bit more about it now. But let me just say, so I'll talk about uh, total cost um, in, in just a moment. Um, it's kind of obvious that profit is just a difference between revenue and cost. And before I start talking about total cost, I'll just mention that marginal profit, which we'll be getting to, is is equal to marginal revenue minus marginal cost. In other words, if if total profit is total revenue minus total cost, then marginal profit is marginal revenue minus marginal cost. Now I'm not going to prove that. If any of you guys know calculus, then this is just the elementary result that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. So we'll get to marginal in the next video. But I want to end this video by talking about total cost. Because this is another area where the assumption we're going to make in this class seems to non-economists to be exactly the opposite of the assumption that you'd want to make. So the assumption that we're going to make is that the total cost function looks like this. So TC is an abbreviation for total cost, and, and, and TR is an abbreviation for total revenue. I guess I didn't write that down. TR is total revenue, and TC is total cost versus quantity. And we're going to assume it has this kind of shape, which is called convex. For those who know calculus, the second derivative is positive. Now, most people look at this, I'll, I'll explain it in a moment, and and think that's got to be wrong. That, that in the real world, total cost probably looks like this. Right, now this is total cost. This is an average or marginal cost. So total cost is measured in dollars. It's not measured in dollars per any unit. So clearly, if a firm is going to produce more Q, the costs are going to go up. I mean, it costs more to produce 20 widgets than it does to cost 10 widgets, because we're not talking about the per unit cost. But in, in the second graph here, you can see that as quantity goes up, cost increases slower and slower and slower. If we do think about marginal cost, you know, that's the slope of the tangent line. Uh, these tangent lines are getting flatter and flatter. I'll, I'll talk more about, uh, the next video will, be, will, will say more about tangent lines. But the point is that um, this total cost function is rising more slowly than a straight line. This is the what I sometimes call the Walmart situation 
Whereas Walmart got bigger and bigger and bigger, its per unit cost started to fall. So you enjoyed it enjoyed economies of scale. And sure, as it got bigger, it had to pay more money to its input suppliers because it was buying a whole lot more stuff. But its total cost wasn't rising as quickly as quantity. We instead are usually going to assume this kind of behavior. This is called convex. So here, if you think about a straight line, how a straight line would work, total cost is rising more quickly than a straight line. This means as the firms get bigger, they actually suffer disadvantages compared to smaller firms. This is counterintuitive because most of us think you know, firms want to get bigger because if they get bigger, they can be kind of like Walmart. The bigger you are, the more discounts you can negotiate with your suppliers. And so the bigger you are, the lower your per unit cost. And so you compete better against your competitors and you might be able to drive them out of business. Very few industries are characterized by the shape on the left where it's smaller firms that have advantages over bigger firms. Now, there are some, um, I don't know, barbershops you can think of maybe as an industry where, you know, you don't see gigantic barbershops or chains that have barbershops in a million different cities. Um, so there might be some industries that, that look like ours, or uh, the assumption that we're going to make, um, I think most industries look like Walmart. So why are we not going to make the Walmart assumption? Mm, so there's a relationship between total cost here and total revenue. It turns out that if you make the Walmart assumption, you don't have competition. Because if you make the Walmart assumption, then the bigger Q is, the bigger the firm is, the more it can outcompete its rivals. And so you're probably going to end up with just a few big firms. Once you end up with a few big firms, it doesn't make sense to assume that they take prices given. If you just got a few big firms, the firms are the ones that are going to be controlling the price. So the Walmart assumption is not consistent with price-taking behavior on the revenue side. It's not consistent with perfect competition. So if we want to make things simple on the revenue side by assuming perfect competition, we're going to have to stick with this. That's our excuse. It's not a very good excuse. I will sometimes remind you that we're making this assumption because it's going to be so natural for you to think that instead th that we ought to be making the assumption on the right where as your output goes up, your average costs fall. But that's not the assumption we're going to make. Um, finally, one more point about the word competitive. So I've defined it mathematically. Competitive means constant price. But the examples I gave for competitive firms are firms like a corn farmer in Iowa or a really tiny petroleum extracting company that's only running 10 or 20 drilling rigs. The hallmark of those kind of firms is they don't compete with their fellow firms in the industry. Corn farmers in Iowa aren't competing against their neighbors. What would be the point? If you're a corn farmer in Iowa and your neighbor's a corn farmer in Iowa, why would you care what your neighbor is doing? I mean, you guys are just tiny, tiny pieces of this gigantic market it doesn't matter to you whether your neighbor does well or does poorly. It couldn't affect you. It doesn't affect you in the least. In other words, the firms that we call competitive, firms like a corn farmer in Iowa, the firms that economists call competitive, that we're going to use the word competitive for in this class, are firms that in ordinary everyday language don't compete. Think about 
Think about Walmart. Okay. Walmart competes. Walmart competes with Target. Walmart studies what Target's doing, knows what prices Target's charging, decides sometimes whether to increase or decrease the price depending on what Target's doing. And Target does the same thing by studying Walmart. In average everyday language, we say that Walmart and Target compete. But that's not the way economists use the English language. Economists do not describe Walmart and Target as being competitive. Uh, the language we actually use is imperfectly competitive. So in this class, the sort of Walmart Target rivalry, that's not competition. Because we're going to use competition in this very technical economic sense, where competition means, or sometimes we say perfect competition. So, comp uh, sorry. Uh, competition. is equal to perfect competition. They mean the same thing in this class. Um, these are going to be situations like the corn farmer in Iowa or the guy that's running 10 to 20 drilling wheels, uh, rigs, really tiny firms that take prices as given and don't compete in the everyday sense of the word compete. Okay, so I think that's enough uh, for this video. We will. Um, We'll continue along these lines in the next one.